Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Enrique Mendizabal. I'm the director of um, Think Tanks, and I'm going to be moderating the session on the relationship, the partnership between think tanks and political parties. Um, we have four speakers, um, uh, this, a plus a discussant. Um, Aida uh, Sahari from uh, Ideas in Malaysia, Sonia Schiffers from the Hendrik Paul Foundation Germany, but in, working in Georgia, Tim Durant uh, from the Institute of Government for Government in the UK, and Leandro Edge, a consultant and uh, long-time collaborator with OTT. And then Hans Goodbrod will be discussing uh, with, uh, with us, and I'm just going to let Hans in. I think I've just done that into the conversation um and what what brings us together i think one of the one of the challenges that we we explore when we think about think tanks and trying to get their ideas into into policy is that often they 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 want to deal with policymakers with you know organizations or people they might see as technocrats um not the politicians you know not the ones dealing with uh, necessarily with the vote or the public uh, and often find it a little bit, a little bit hard. So now we today, today we're joined by think tankers from Malaysia, Argentina, Germany, and the UK um, uh, to share experiences and lessons from their own work uh, with political parties, as well as with partisan think tanks, which I think in in themselves are, are an interesting category of, uh, of organizations. And we can ask them to bring their different perspectives into into this conversation. As a reminder, we've asked ourselves and everybody in the in, in the conference three key questions what why should think tanks engage with in this case political parties what are the challenges of partnerships with political parties and how can we make those partnerships work um, how can they be strengthened um, and already in the little sort of chit chat before this session um, I, I put forward the idea that maybe the word partnership is a little bit loaded and what we really mean uh, or want to do is uh, talk about collaboration, engagement, cooperation between uh, different organizations, think tanks being, uh, being one of them. Um, so let me let me start with uh, Ida uh, and ask you to tell us a little bit about your experience um, in, in Malaysia. You are a, a non-partisan think tank, uh, but you've been able to work with political parties, uh, with a range of political parties, um, so let, tell us a little bit about, about that experience. Why, why was that collaboration important? Why was it possible? What have you learned? Thank you very much, Enrique. Uh, my name is Ira Azhari. I'm uh, a senior manager for the Democracy and Governance Unit at the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, Ideas in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So good evening to everyone. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, how Ideas as, a, as an independent non-partisan think tank uh, has been uh, developing uh, relationships uh, and trying to um, sort of work with political parties from across the spectrum uh, here in Malaysia. And uh, maybe before I uh, tell everyone about the work that we do, um, just to uh, also explain Ideas' position in, in Malaysia as a think tank. Uh, in, in Malaysia, uh, well, the word think tank is actually not very common in Malaysia. Uh, if, you, if you come here and you, you tell people you work in a think tank, people probably wouldn't know what you're, what you're talking about. So, um, I, so we usually describe ourselves as a, a research institute or, um, you know, just a non-profit organization. And, um, but think tanks have been flourishing, I think, over the last few years in Malaysia. Uh, but the uh, most, or if not all, of, uh, of think tanks in Malaysia are either affiliated to political parties or to state governments or to the federal government even. So Ideas is uh, one, uh, one of the very, very few, uh, if not the only one, uh, that uh, is not, uh, has, does not have any of those affili affiliations. We are independently funded and um, we, uh, our we we never originated from a party or from from state government so um having that position i think uh is uh, i mean it has its pros and cons but i think one of the positives is that um in a highly partisan uh society and country like malaysia where um you know politics is so uh ingrained i think in, in people's uh, daily lives uh being 
uh, nonpartisan and independent, I think, gives us uh, some air of credibility uh, that, uh, you know, where if, if, if people, the first thing, one of the first things that people ask us would be, oh, you know, which, which party are you serving? And we're like, no, we, uh, you know, that sort of makes people, um, uh, I, I do notice that uh, there is, uh, we can build, start building the relationship of trust pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, so I think in terms of working with political parties, um, uh, the the topic or the the cause actually that triggered this um, uh, this relationship building with political parties was uh, political funding regulation. So in Malaysia, we do not have a law uh, that regulates uh, political contributions, um, uh, monetary and also non-monetary. So uh, that has become a huge problem uh, in political uh, corruption in Malaysia, as you can imagine. Um, we had a huge, uh, huge, huge uh, corruption scandal uh, a few years ago. Uh, that erupted uh, because uh, billions of US dollars were found inside one of our prime minister's uh, personal bank accounts. So that became a huge uh, scandal and uh, it triggered this, uh, this, this demand for um, political financing reforms in Malaysia. And Ideas uh, was um, at the forefront of that, um, of fighting for that, that cause. And uh, over the years that I've worked at Ideas, I realized that, um, you know, we have been working very well with other CSOs, uh, with other think tanks in, in Malaysia on this topic, but why are we not uh, working directly with political parties? Uh, at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to be affected by this law. And, uh, you know, the politicians are the ones in parliament who will be debating it tabling it uh, if it eventually does get tabled. So I realized that there is a vacuum there. Why are we not working with them? So uh, in 2019, 2020, an opportunity came where uh, we, we got some funding to um, to work on uh, this, this topic on political funding reforms. And uh, at the time, I think uh, there was a lot of interest from young people in, in, uh, in Malaysian politics. So um, uh, my our then CEO and I thought, okay, why not we work with young people in political parties, right? Because, uh, you know, there was, I think at the time as well, uh, we thought that uh, if we kept working with the same old politicians, uh, we were not going to get anywhere, honestly, because there was just so little political will to, to reform the system. But uh, there was some uh, indication of, uh, of of interest by the younger politicians in, in all, across all parties, actually. So uh, we did uh, two workshops uh, with uh, political parties, with young, with youth, the youth wings of political parties, in uh, 2020, uh, which proved to be very successful, actually. And we did a couple more uh, with them, uh, pol young politicians at the state level uh, from different parties. And uh, some of the feedback we got was that this was the first time ever that a, a think tank, a civil society organization approached them uh, to um, to work on, on any cause actually. So they've never actually been approached by civil society before. And uh, they, uh, they found it a very, very positive experience. Um, and then uh, earlier this year, uh, another window of opportunity came up where um, this conversation on political financing reforms again came to the forefront uh, amongst our politicians. And uh, we saw another chance to where, uh, you know, we, we thought that uh, why don't we sort of formalize this relationship a bit more and um, try and uh, sort of reignite this conversation about political funding. So we decided to form an all-party parliamentary group, an APPG, uh, which is uh, in Malaysia, it's a, uh, uh, it, uh, it's not a, the, this is, this uh, entity is very very new, unlike in the UK where um, you know I think it's it's been around for a long time. But in Malaysia, it's basically a platform where civil society and uh, parliamentarians can sort of sit down together on a formal platform that's recognized by parliament uh, to to discuss um, any topic. So we formed an APPG on political financing. Uh, we got the support from nine MPs from nine different political parties from government and opposition. And we've just had our second official meeting uh, last week where, you know, all the MPs were uh, supportive of uh, bringing this cause to the forefront of tabling a bit the bill on political funding. And we're in the process of doing that. I mean, it's a very slow, painstaking process and there might be elections this year, which means that the APPG will be dissolved and it will have to start all over again. But I think 
uh, just the fact that we got the support from these nine MPs to sit on the same table to issue a statement about how important this issue is, I think, um, I don't think any other think tank in Malaysia has, has managed to do that. So uh, that has yeah. been our experience so far. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I think I think that's very interesting because it, I don't know if in, in the minds of, of many of you, but certainly in my head, um, and this is my own bias, I was thinking about partnerships between a think tank and a political party, but what you are doing is different. You are engaging with as many parties as you can. Right? So, and that reinforces uh, ideas, um, position of, of independence or of, of uh, non-partisanship in this, in this engagement. Um, I think, Leandro, maybe you can talk about that later, but Leandro and I participated last year in an initiative by Grupo Faro in Ecuador uh, aimed at supporting young people in political parties in Ecuador to think about either developing uh, partisan think tanks, internal research research teams, or better relationship with think tanks. So and we, we also found a lot of demand from young, young you know, to be political leaders, I guess. Uh, for engaging with uh, with these ideas, that that is interesting. Um, yeah, Sonia, you've also worked in nonpartisan think tanks um, and engaged with politics. Can you tell us something about that experience in a completely different context to the uh, to the Malaysian context? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you um, to, for inviting me to this session. Uh, my name is Sonja Schiffers and now I am the director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation South Caucasus office. Um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation is affiliated with the German Greens and our um, foundation headquarters are in Germany, um, but I'm based in Tbilisi. Um, pr prior to my work here, um, I worked at the German Bundestag um, for the German Greens and uh, prior to that I worked for non-partisan, or no, I didn't work for them, but I was affiliated with them, important difference uh, for the German Institute um, for International and Security Affairs and uh, that is clearly a non-partisan think tank. Um, so. Um, I wanted to reflect a bit on my um, experiences primarily there and then later I, I'm also happy to answer um, questions about my current um, uh, work and how we work um, with the Greens and maybe also with parties in Georgia, um, which spoiler, we don't, <laughs> but um, I, I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, so generally, I think um, working with political parties is a great way to bring uh, research results into the political life and to um, influence policy making. Um, and I think that um, especially on less contested and polarized issues, um, influence can actually be easier than um, one often would expect. Um, simply, uh, and that's my experience from working uh, for an MP and for a parliamentary group, um, there is always so much time pressure in politics and there's always so much happening that usually politicians, um, I mean, at least those with whom I worked, uh, would be happy for uh, fact-based, um, evidence-based, well-argued um, um, yeah, solutions to political problems. So I think, um, of course, there are time constraints, but generally, my impression is that uh, politicians would be more open than uh, one would expect um, from the outside. And in the best case, um, I think this can be a mutually uh, beneficial relationship between um, think tanks who want to bring their um, findings into, into the political realm and um, politicians who want to um, provide solutions to political problems and also of course, promote themselves <laughs> with them at the same time. Um, and uh, both can uh, actually benefit um, from this relationship. But of course, uh, if you are a nonpartisan think tank, then it's important to uh, work not only with one party, but with different parties um, in order to avoid um, yeah, a partisanship, which, uh, or at least this impression that you favor one party over another, because yeah, when you're a nonpartisan, it's of course important to, um, to work with different uh, political players. Um, and um, you also asked whether think tanks are prepared. Um, and my um, experience is that um, it varies. Um, some are very prepared and some think tankers are very prepared. And I think others are not so well prepared um, because um, 
I think working with politicians uh, and parties, one really has to understand under how much time pressure they are and how limited their um, um, possibilities are to read long papers, um, to read very academic texts, and also to meet people <laughs> simply because they have so many meetings. So I think if you want to engage uh, with them, you have to be very flexible and you have to provide information in a way that is easily accessible um, for, yeah, for those who are under a lot of time pressure. Um, and maybe a last point. Um, I would stress is I think what is often underestimated is the role of staffers. So um, um, I think my impression is that think tankers often think they have to meet MPs. Um, but um, I think this is not necessarily the case because staffers are um, actually um, in many cases um, influential. They um, draft speeches, they um, draft um, motions in Parliament, um, of course, together with the MPs, but um, I think it's a very um, promising approach to work uh, with staffers, actually, um, instead of to always expect MPs to be there and, and to engage with you. Um, and yeah, maybe last, last point, um, and uh, I'm happy to, to discuss this later, but um, I think um, I don't have a kind of um, you know, um, this kind of thinking that it's better to be partisan or to be non-partisan. I think you can be both, but it's important to be transparent about it. And actually now um, I work for a partisan think tank and I'm actually very proud of it <laughs> and I like it because um, it's clear that we have a value-based agenda and um, I mean, we have it everywhere written on our website, and I think it's also nothing to be ashamed of. So um, as long as you are um, transparent about it, then I think um, you can be both, and it's just different uh, type of work. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I think you, you've also highlighted something else. It's, it's um, not to think about parties as, as the, 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 the actor, right? So within parties, you've got maybe the party structure, Party as the institution, but as you said, you mentioned politicians, so the party, the party members uh, that are in positions of power, but then everybody else that that works within a party and that might play might play very different roles and that might give researchers and think tanks access to those spaces where ideas are debated, where ideas are demanded, you know, where decisions are made. Uh, and I think that's an interesting interesting division. And I guess it also makes made me think as I was looking at. At my screen is that you know one thing our political parties in Germany, another thing might be political parties in Peru, another thing might be political parties in in, in Mozambique. Right? So so some some parties might be in a better position, and some party systems might be in a better position to uh, accommodate, allow, or you know um, for think tanks to engage with them in a in a formal, maybe more informal way. But um, you mentioned this issue about pride and. Uh, you know, nothing to be ashamed of uh, working for a part of the partisan think tank. Uh, it's important to be transparent. Leandro, Leandro, you've worked, uh, you've researched partisan think tanks. You looked at the a case of a partisan think tank in, in Argentina. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, what is a partisan, partisan think tank? What would differentiate it from, from uh, non-partisan think tanks like the ones uh, like IDEA? And uh, and this for government and other think tanks. Yes, uh, thank you, Enrique, um, and thanks everyone for joining and, and for the invitation to, to participate in, in the conference. Um, yes, I, I, as you said, I, I research about uh, the collaboration between political parties and think tanks, and, and especially I, I focus on uh, an actor that has not been explored that much. I found. Um, and, and that is partisan think tanks, also called internal organic think tanks. Um, and the reason why uh, there are not many documented experiences is, is that there are not a, a, a very a common a figure in, in at least in, in Latin America, where I'm, I'm mostly focused, um, especially under the, the term of think tanks, right? You, you most often uh, find uh, structures within the, the political parties that uh, 
are devoted to generate uh, reflection and, and sometimes uh, train political uh, cadres, but not so much organizations doing research to inform policy proposals, policy solutions, uh, debates in the in the parliament, etc. So I thought it was uh, an interesting uh, avenue to explore. Um, I would say the the main difference between uh, an independent think tank and, and a partisan think tank is that um, the the latter uh, direct their, their efforts to of, of generation of ideas and and so on policy solutions to uh, one political force, one political far party to which they uh, are there explicitly uh, and build um, collaboration strategies that are more formal, that uh, are, uh, you know, has some structure, some frequency, some uh, dedicated spaces uh, and, uh, and mechanisms. Um, so, we, my colleagues talked about what's some of the benefits that think tanks can get from collaborating with, with, with political parties uh, in terms of uh, legitimacy, uh, strengthening of the of independence uh, yeah, uh, approach. But I will also add that uh, having worked at think tanks uh, myself in Argentina, I think that uh, one of the benefits of the of the relationship with with political parties for think tanks is that uh, it, it's pretty it it, it uh, introduces complexity uh, in the in the in the thinking process in terms of what are all the different uh, interests and motivations that political actors have uh, so it's pretty much a learning process and also it's a necessity when you are addressing. Um, policy issues that, uh, because of their nature, are uh, multi-actoral and requires multiple perspectives and agreements to be to be addressed. And from the perspective of the, of the think tanks, um, there are a few functions that, uh, uh, from the perspective of political parties, sorry, there are a few functions that think tanks can play, a few roles that are uh, important for uh, both um, political parties that work with internal think tanks and with uh, external think tanks. Um, basically, um, we can say, uh, um, some literature says that the expert knowledge that think, think tanks uh, have uh, can uh, play three main functions vis-a-vis um, -vis political parties or the political sphere. One is uh, the instrumental function, that is uh, generating, generating inputs that can be uh, apply to policy solutions, to policy uh, debates. Uh, the second one is uh, symbolic. Uh, there is uh, legitimacy coming from uh, engaging with uh, experts, with uh, organizations that uh, dedicate to the generation of ideas. And a third function is uh, networking. Uh, there are a lot of um, networks, uh, people, experts that think things can uh, bring in uh, into the conversation for with political parties. More concretely, um, and think tanks, uh, you know, work as sounding boards for for political for policymakers for political leaders. Sometimes they provide a safe space that uh, is not the same as discussing ideas in the public sphere. Uh, the second one, uh, another more concrete function is that, uh, as I said. Um, Think tanks can provide inputs to uh, for the battle of ideas that uh, that all political parties uh, try to to address to impose their own their own ideas, um, and and also an important function is the training of, of cadres. When you have an internal, uh, we have seen experience where political parties uh, partner with uh, think tanks to um, conduct trainings. For their um, for their cadres to uh, improve uh, speaking in public, to provide inputs for uh, policy proposals in, in elections, in electoral periods, uh, etc. Um, so I think there are benefits from from both sides. Um, I think I can I can stop there.
at this point. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I, I think what emerges from there, from those functions, is that, of course, um, you know, political parties will engage with think tanks as long as they're so useful to them, right? They give them give them ideas if the if the political space requires ideas, they would give them sort of credibility if the political space requires them to use them for that credibility. They'll engage with them because it might give them, as you said, you know, analysts and future future policymakers, um, and uh, and you know, use them as much as they can. I think it would challenge for think tanks to make sure that they are they are always necessary uh, in that in that space. But I think you also um, make me think about again thinking about parties. Um, that parties are not just parties, right? They parties that might be in power or parties might be in opposition, and they probably need different things and they. You know they are in different stages, and I know Tim, you've been doing some thinking about that. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about that difference, right? The relationship between think tanks, or maybe in the case of the Institute for Government, the relationship of, between the Institute for Government and the, and political parties in opposition and in government. Sure. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So, just first off, like everyone else, to say thank you very much for for the invitation, and it is great to be here. I'm learning a lot already, so this is this is fantastic. Um, the Institute for Government here in London, we are also a, a non-partisan, impartial think tank. So we work with uh, the governing party, which is the Conservatives in the UK, and we also work with opposition. The main opposition party is the Labour Party, but other parties across the country as well. Uh, and when I was preparing this, I was thinking about kind of how we approach those conversations differently. So sometimes some things are, are similar between both types of parties, some of the points that people have already mentioned. So as Sonia said, you know, politicians, they don't have very much time, they're incredibly busy, they want things accessible, they want things easy to understand. And I think that's true of both, obviously, government ministers, if they're from the governing party, are particularly busy, but any politician is going to be busy. Um, but there are some things that are different about how we engage with, with each type of party. So on the government side, because of what we work on, we look at we look at how government works and processes and structures and how that can be improved. And so as a result, it's quite easy, I think, for government politicians to feel that we're criticizing them individually we're saying well this isn't good enough you should do this better and actually a large part of our effort is saying well no we're not we're not criticizing you mr minister we're criticizing the system we're interested in how the system can be improved um, and we we often need to kind of reiterate that that is our objective um the second point that we have to think about is is the point you made enrique about how are we useful to them how is this in their interest if we're just saying things because it makes us feel good or because it makes us look good, then that's that's fine. You know, we get a buzz, but it doesn't actually change anything. Whereas if we can show, well, actually, this is good for you because X, Y, Z, I think that's really, really important. Um, here in the UK, the, uh, uh, this is true, most countries, you know, the government has obviously a lot more resources than the opposition. So when the government is in, when, when a particular party is in government, they have the support of civil servants to help them think about policy ideas and, and ways of doing things. So it's often the case that we might write to a minister or, or talk to them at an event and say, oh, we think you should think about this. And they'll say, oh, we'll go and talk to some civil servants about it. And that's fine. But actually, to make things happen, for the big changes to happen, it is the political decision makers that you need to engage with. So we have to keep going back to, okay, well, who, who is the right person? Who is the kind of you know, this individual minister, how can we speak to him or her about this issue and make sure we're, we're identifying with them. Um, and the other point I want to make about governing parties, I think it's, it's often the case because of the work of government is so broad, that the governing party can be quite disparate, it can be quite spread out. So you can have party HQ, and then you can have staff in parliament, and then you can have ministers in government buildings, and then you can have members out across the country. Um, and actually, they can all take different positions on an issue, and it's harder for the party to kind of unify around a central um, uh, decision or a central thought process than it is for the opposition, because the opposition is smaller, they'll tend to spend more time together. So actually, when you're trying to talk to government, it's about both working out who is the key person, but also what are the different schools of thought within the party, who are the different people arguing for different things and trying to work out who your allies are there. And then on the opposition side, um, so yeah, here in the UK, we, we always have the second biggest party generally is, is the official opposition, and they, they play an important role in, in holding the, the government to account. Um, 
we also have to be careful, therefore, if we're talking to them, that we're not just giving them ammunition to criticise the government because we don't want to be seen as being partisan that way. That we don't want to be seen as okay. You're always saying bad things about the government, or the Labour Party are always using the Institute for Government's work to say bad things about the government, and therefore nobody in government will listen to us. So when we're engaging with the opposition, we have to think, okay, here's here's what we think, but this is why it's again, this is why it's useful to them, and this is why it's useful to the wider debate. It's not a partisan point. Um, that point about debate, I think, is really key. It feels to me, you know, the, the major power of an opposition party is getting things into debate. So asking questions about it in Parliament, making it the point about failings in government in media interviews, um, and so on and so forth. And so if we can feed our ideas to them, then they can get those ideas into the wider debate. That doesn't mean there'll be a direct impact in, you know, a government decision immediately. But hopefully, down the line, you can see, oh, well, they said this, and then a government minister said X, and therefore, and that kind of long chain of action is, is really important. And then just a, a more practical point um, as well that I've experienced is because opposition parties have less resources, you know, they don't have the civil service there to support them, they tend to be e tend to be sort of even even more stretched in terms of what they can actually think about. So we always, when we're pitching presentations or, or writing to opposition members of parliament or politicians more generally, we always think about how can we make this the most accessible possible and again, show upfront why it's in their interest to engage with us because um, they they have even less support and even less resources than those in government. So we want to make sure that we we make it as easy, you know, we do all the work, we go to them rather than expecting them to come to us, basically. Um, I'm sure there's lots more we can talk about, but I think I'll stop there and, yeah. and let's get into the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, Hans, um, I'm gonna let you um, reflect or react and maybe offer a few a few points and ask a few questions, but then I'm gonna ask every, everybody else to uh, think about anything you wanna to add or ask a question to to all one of your colleagues, um, I think there's a there's a nice line of, of discussion that we can follow. And uh, as we've gone from uh, Ida to Sonia and Leandro and then Tim, I think we've unpacked the idea of political parties, right? The youth, uh, political leaders, opposition, government, um, politicians, parties, staffers, uh, different levels uh, of country or government, um, etc. Different functions, as Leandro was saying, different ways of using evidence and things that Hans, um, what do you what do you think about this yeah well thank you for the presentations which I enjoyed a lot and uh, that was very interesting um, uh, a few years ago or quite a few years ago I had a conversation with a with a political consultant who was consulting parties so to speak uh, in terms of how to do elections Jeremy Rosner who worked with uh, Stanley Greenberg uh, in a lot of countries and that was the firm that had originally advised uh, Clinton and Blair, but then had done work with Nelson Mandela as well. Um, and one of the interesting things he said is that he felt that um, the success of a political transition or of a political opportunity, so to speak, in a country of a window for reform, that in his experience, having worked, I think, literally in dozens of countries, uh, but again, directly on the political side, I mean, fully owned, not on the policy side, uh, really with a focus towards winning election. He said that that in a really important way depended on the think tank landscape. Uh, that was his impression. It wasn't a study, but that was his impression from what he saw. And I think the argument was that uh, if you don't have that, and if the political parties come in just with, yes, potentially grassroots contacts, yes, potentially people that have some government experience, but no particular depth in reflecting and systematically reflecting on the policy issues, that they will really struggle uh, to get a reform on track. And, uh, and you don't actually have that much time to, to demonstrate the first successes to, uh, to the population at large, but also to yourself in order to move all of this forward. So I think in some ways that that nexus of uh, think tanks also with in how they connect to actual political um, action, I think is, is relevant there. And I enjoyed the, uh, really enjoyed the presentation uh, uh, across 
uh, various points. With Ira, one of the, the questions that, that came to my mind, I'll just go through it very briefly, and I think we should leave time for comments. But with Ira, one of the questions that I had is, how do you how you deal with people that that potentially are on the inside and on the outside? I mean, do you actually get them into a room together? Is is what are the things that you found work there? Of course, one one of the ways that people sometimes slice it is that they have something that's on youth or a particular segment, or sometimes the hope is that women will be a little nicer to each other than if you bring the the man into the room. That that may brawl that. That may or may not work, but I've seen that done uh, in in various contexts, uh, especially male-dominated contexts, that that people try and uh, maybe create a commonality there. And I'm curious for your uh, experience there. Um, the Sonia, I'd be curious. Uh, you, you mentioned that sometimes it's easy to to actually have that act. Uh, it, you, you know that that people can be receptive because they're so busy. And I really like the point that you made about staffers. Um, this is also a kind of a, an interesting point that was um, uh, uh, that, that sometimes comes up about how permeable certain places can be. That you can actually go to um, uh, to speak either on the very highest level, or you can try and place an op-ed in the major journal. But at the same time, the relationship from the bottom up, and sometimes I think convincing Georgian politicians at a time when they took, uh, or some politicians, when they took D.C. very seriously, going to Washington, D.C. very seriously, that actually meeting with the senator is very nice, but meeting with, with the staffers can be even more important because they keep con continuous attention matters. Um, I'd be curious on maybe if you, you have particular items of concrete examples of an impact that was easier than people expected, because it may just illuminate that. Um, that uh, the, the the point that you made that it's actually worth reaching out in that way. Leandro, um, one question that I had for you, I enjoyed what you talked about, the battle of ideas. And maybe just, maybe this is just my particular interest, uh, but maybe it's an interest that's shared a little bit in Latin America and that I've, I have to admit, I was just looking up and trying to make sense of that myself. In CIPEC, of course, we had Nico Ducote, who was a kind of interesting, I mean, if you will, in some ways, almost paradigmatic figure. Um, Enrique, you once said that the, the that whoever's gone to the Kennedy School has kind of has, has got it kind of figured out anyway. They they somehow. I think that's what you said. I, I don't think that was meant as an official endorsement of the institution, but the point seemed to be along the lines that there's a certain kind of either pre-selection or um a kind of dynamism that these people can bring and Nico Ducote I think was an interesting example with CIPEC and I think represents to me what sometimes at least that was my impression but the kind of transition then into politics and this is the point that I think one sometimes also makes to think tankers that get frustrated that okay if you really really are incredibly frustrated um, at a think tank level then maybe it's time to actually go directly into that. And so I just wonder, Leandro, whether that's because you're familiar with that context, whether that particular case, not that I want to make a particular person a case study, but still, I mean, CIPIC is a landmark institution, I think, in beyond Latin America even. And so whether there's something we can learn from that. And then Tim, again, I mean, of course, I think both Enrique and I, of course, love the work that, that you do with, with ministers and the interviews and uh, found it instructive. And uh, we certainly hope to do more here. Um, and just something that came to my mind was the question I recently was talking with a political, uh, with someone that leads a political party uh, affiliated organization, the National Democratic Institute, in some ways similar, in other ways, very different from what Sonia does. Um, and uh, he used to work with um, uh, with the Mendelssohns and Blairs, et cetera, et cetera, and talked about how sometimes pol some of the politicians got the policy components but didn't actually get the, the politics component, that sometimes you just have to be uh, uh, mercenary enough uh, on some of those things as well. And then I asked him one question. He was on both sides, and I, or one question came up, and I said, what did you enjoy more? Did you enjoy more being on the government side or more on the opposition side? And his eyes kind of lit up and said, oh, much more on the opposition side. 
because he felt he, he could run insurgencies and kind of always think, and whereas in government, you had to be kind of defensive and always worry about the next thing that was kind of, kind of um, uh, be difficult. And I just wonder what your impressions there are. And I think, I mean, that also speaks a little bit to the kind of context within which think tanks also need to be dynamic and entrepreneurial and build connections that later then once people potentially switch, if there is a switch, there isn't a switch in, in all countries in terms of people getting into politics, but if there is a switch uh, that can work. And maybe some of those questions, uh, Enrique, you decide how you want to run it with time. Maybe I'm a little bit now over time, but there's just so lots lots of thoughts yeah. that, that that got inspired and maybe we can tie this into a broader discussion as well. So Enrique, Thank over you. to you. Thank, thanks, Hans. Uh, I think there's, as always, um, there's always never enough time with these sessions, but uh, it's better to finish on a high and uh, you know leaving people wanting more and we can continue the conversation. Um, I, don't, I have a friend who um, now leads a think tank and once told me when you're in, a, after he spent some time in government, he said, when you're in a think tank, everything is possible. But when you're in government, it's only what's regulated that, you, that is possible. So, um, Tim, why don't, you, why don't we start with you um, and maybe response and reflection on what, um, what Hans was doing and then we'll go, we'll go back in the, uh, the opposite, opposite direction uh, as we started. Sure, that sounds and good. I asked, I asked it to be slightly brief so we can uh, we can get in a few a couple of questions only from uh, from. Absolutely, questions. yeah. Uh, I mean, I agree. I think I think the same is probably true when you're in opposition. Well, I'm, I've never been a politician of either side. I'm not sure if the opposition would say the same. They probably don't feel like anything is possible. But there is there is a kind of a blank sheet of paper, right? And I think um, a lot of the issues that we're seeing at the moment in the UK, you can imagine if there is a change of government at some point in the next few years. Uh, it will be a big opportunity for the Labour Party to come in and say, okay, we're going to do things very differently. They've had a long time in opposition, 12 years now, and they'll be, they've got lots of ideas about what they would like to do. Um, they obviously, uh, your point, Hans, about the kind of the transition point is interesting. There aren't many people in the Labour Party who have experience of having been in government under Tony Blair or Gordon Brown um, back in the 2010 or the noughties. So there, there, there will be a difficult transition when it happens, if it happens. But I think they will have lots of ideas of things to do, whereas this government uh, definitely does feel like it's, it feels under siege. It's always being criticised. It's always, you know, it's, it's been there for 12 years in varying forms and it feels a bit tired, I think. So I think uh, I can see, totally see the appeal of opposition. Uh, at the same time, you don't get anything done unless you're in government. So. Thanks, and uh, Leandro. Yes, to some extent, um, you're sorry, you're you've been responding to some extent to uh, to Tim's last phrase, right? So, after a while in 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 think tanks, many of uh, CPEX, uh, I think almost all of the CPEX directors have moved on to government, uh, one after the other, and many of their researchers have done the same um, at different levels, right? And that, that probably comes without. That, that feeling that, you know, in government, I can do more. Yes. Um, thanks, Hans, for the for the questions. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I would try to talk more generally, not, not to focus on one, one organization. Um, but I, I basically think tanks, especially when they achieve certain uh, reputation, uh, become uh, privileged platforms for uh, different leaders that want to uh, prove themselves in, in politics. Um, I think that's, that's I, I can say a few things about that. One is uh, from the perspective of the think tank, um, what happens when uh, you claim independency and then three, four of your last uh, leaders uh, go to the same political party uh, with, with uh, power like in, in high level positions. Uh, now there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, probably think tanks will have to uh, come up with a with narrative or some communication strategies to mitigate the impact that uh, that can have on, on their reputation as, as independent. That's one thing. From the other, from the other hand, as I, as I was saying, 
Um, I think uh, there are certain political parties that might be more prone to uh, bring in uh, this type of, of leaders um, or not only thinkers, but NGO representatives and leaders. Um, I think it has to do with, with the sometimes can uh, have to do with their origins, how a political party uh, uh, comes to life. That was the case of the partisan, the, the party that I study, um, which has a very important faction that was uh, NGO representatives. Um, and at the same time, that, that link with, with the civil society can introduce, as I said, some legitimacy. Um, and especially the idea of a think tank can, can be can introduce some legitimacy and idea of modernity. That's also another finding of the study, you know. This this idea that we are we are uh, we care about evidence, we care about planning, and we have this think tank, and we call it like that because it's very uh, new and in, in our uh, country, um, and we differentiate ourselves from uh, the old politics that are more um, about uh, ideology, about uh, intuition, um, power, and, and territorial um, penetration. So, yeah, uh, those are the references I would like to share in terms of, of that relations. And, and I also know from, from experience, from talking to, to people that went from think tanks to political parties that, uh, okay, you might be frustrated after years working in a think tank, but once you, you move to, to politics, uh, you can also get a lot of frustration because, uh, as we discussed, uh, there are a lot of other barriers and things you need to learn uh to, to to navigate that that space that is completely different thank you thank you leander and i just make me think as well that you know, this, we talked about a movement from think tanks to parties but the movement back or the you know probably gives the opportunity to think tanks to learn a bit more about what goes on in government um and it also gives polit politicians the ability to kind of recharge and reflect on on their time in government and or the time in, in opposition and and maybe come up with new new ideas and so i think that's something to be ready uh, uh that might be a challenge for them to be ready to receive people that are used to a different rhythm of things right different uh different support systems i remember visiting a former minister of finance after she'd been a minister for a long time in her office back at her office in the university and, and you know she kind of felt a bit lost uh because you know she'd been working with teams and Making big decisions and and you know getting things done and uh, and all of a sudden she was back in you know the old office it just wasn't the right place for her anymore and I think the the organization you know could have taken advantage of of that experience if it had been prepared to receive her you know and to give her the chance to share what she'd learned uh, in government. Um, Sonia. Do you want to respond to hands, maybe? Yeah, actually, I want to. And this is also a point that I had noted down in advance, uh, because I think it is still um, relatively uncommon, um, at least in Germany. Um, and I think um, in Georgia, it would be even more uncommon um, for people who have been working with. Well, no, in Georgia, it's actually not uncommon. But then these people move to partisan think tanks or to think tanks which are not officially partisan, but have partisan affiliations. But um, in Germany, um, what, I, what I wanted to say is that um, even for a staffer, I think it could be difficult to um, work for some of the non-partisan think tanks, or at least you would get many questions like, um, oh, but are you still objective because you work for a political party? And how can you do um, objective research and engage with different parties? And I think, um, I mean, to some extent, I understand the skepticism. But um, on the other hand, I think it's a missed opportunity um, because, as you said, um, Enrique, I think um, think tanks could really benefit from um, staff with uh, experience in, in politics or government, um, well, in politics, let's say, um, and um, also um, I think it's based on this assumption that um, people who don't work for political parties are objective and those who work for parties are not objective. And um, also there is another problematic assumption or like problematic issue in it for me, namely that 
um, I don't know, I think there's this kind of joke, like you, when you're a political scientist and you're not political, then there is something wrong. <laughs> um, because, um, I mean, if you work on these policy issues, then I think you always have, uh, I mean, most people would probably have a, a personal opinion about these um, choices, if either one or another, based on your personal um, values. And um, of course, um, you as a think tanker, you should um, not just put your uh, personal opinion there as, as the only one, but um, I think um, it's it's still um, not genuine to suggest that uh, those who work for nonpartisan think tanks are objective uh, and those who, who don't are not objective. Also, because I think um, selecting a specific uh, topic, for example, for an article is already political. If I choose a human rights topic, for example, uh, that's different than when I choose, um, I don't know, an economic growth topic or, yeah. So, um, Unfortunately, this mobility is not not so much there, at least in the German context, I would say. Um, regarding Hans' um, points, I think they were all uh, very interesting. And um, this point of uh, having a developed think tank landscape being beneficial for um, um, policy change, um, I think, um, I mean, I haven't actually observed this myself, but I, I can really imagine that this is the case, um, because I have seen how um, during the last programmatic processes of the German Greens, um, so for example, the um, when the Manifesto of Principles, which is the big kind of general program of the party, which is developed every 10 or 20 years, um, was developed last year, um, and also the election program for last year. Um, and now we have a task force uh, on yeah, the position of the party after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, for all these processes, think tanks were very much um, involved. And I think this really, uh, both partisan and non-partisan, and I think um, this really put the um, programs on a very um, sound um, basis of you know evidence, but also... Um, uh, in-depth discussion of advantages, disadvantages of certain policies. So I think this is really uh, important. Um, and uh, regarding specific um, examples of an impact that was easier than expected, um, I don't want to get too specific now, but um, I think actually this impact um, happened almost on a daily basis. So uh, when I worked as a staffer, for example, I was in very close contact with um, think tanks, but also human rights um, NGOs, um, for example, on Belarus, on Turkey. And um, it happened very frequently that they would bring issues to our attention or um, they would have a paper with, uh, I don't know, these are our 10 policy recommendations for Belarus at this point. Um, and then this would enter the um, political field and um, we would be glad to uh, receive these suggestions um, so that doesn't mean of course that they would all be adopted um, but I think um, it's really um, frequent um, that these things happen at least um, what I can say about the green um, environment and, and maybe one last point if I may about um, recommendations I think what I've seen and it's, it sounds kind of obvious but then um, it's seems to me that it's not, um, that recommendations really have to be very specific. And um, especially working with uh, young think tankers, um, I'm not so old myself, but still, um, I mean, I'm also learning, but still uh, we also have um, some programs with um, yeah, young fellows who write their first uh, policy papers. And um, we always discuss with them that um, recommendations like the EU should get better in its migration policy or the EU should no longer exhibit double standards standards are not very um, helpful uh, recommendations and that it's always about the how. I mean, how should this be done? Um, how can the challenges be overcome? And then it's a useful uh, recommendation. Um, and yeah, I think this is something to pay attention to. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's very, that last point is also very interesting. Um, Hans made a reference to the Institute for Government's Minister, Ministers Reflect uh, website and project. Uh, I don't know, Tim, you can share the link on the on the chat or we share it later, but that is one example of a of a, a think tank studying the people that they want to they want to influence, right? So understanding them at a human level. Uh, I remember reading one case of a minister not knowing where 
where the bathrooms were. And so she just went through the whole day not asking because she's a bit embarrassed. But you know, people, you know, ministers are humans, and and so by understanding them in that way, you understand how best to help them and how best to engage with them. And I think what Sonia you're saying as well is understanding the you know the processes, you know, the specific questions they have, how the parties work. Leandro, you made references to factions, you know, within the party, and these things happen where they're not they're not all the same. So if you understand those audiences, and think since you know communication teams and think tanks have gotten good at doing this, understanding their their general audiences, but maybe not as good as understanding specific groups in in that greater detail. Uh, and that, and I always say that's a researchable subject. So I'm sure there are think tankers in that think tank that would take that as a research project themselves and probably get it published. Um, Ida, um, what about those those efforts to bring together different, you know, different parties, different different, you know, um, Anwar made a comment about this in uh, in the chat. You know, in this this very polarized context. You know, what 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 has worked for you? Um, so. And as you can imagine, it, it hasn't been easy. I mean, uh, it, although we are a, a nonpartisan uh, think tank, uh, I mean, in in Malaysia, uh, but I'm not sure about other countries, but in Malaysia, um, if you are an opposition politician, uh, it is just natural for you to be more inclined to uh, being uh, closer to civil society for many reasons. I mean, uh, many politicians in the uh, opposition parties came from civil society themselves. They were human rights activists. They were uh, at the front lines of demonstrations and and, and uh, trade unions and all of that. So, um, so although we are nonpartisan, uh, we it is natural we. So for us to sort of have more politician friends on the opposition uh, side of the of the political divide. So um, in our group of in our APPG where we have nine MPs currently, uh, there are more opposition politicians than there are government. So um, it was uh, very challenging. It still remains very challenging for us to get uh, support from the government parties, uh, which consist of uh, uh, AMNO uh, and, and and several other of the more conservative leaning parties. So. Um, uh, uh, it has been it has been challenging, but I think um, one uh, tip or maybe one uh, something that I've realized is actually something that uh, some of the speakers have already covered, which is um, you know politicians are humans that respond to incentives, right? At the end of the day, and um, and I think the key is to to sort of try and find what those incentives are. And what, what we have found with uh, some of the more uh, reluctant or about some of the more sort of difficult politicians is that um, we in, in our efforts of persuading them we need to show how uh, these reforms or how political how transparency in political funding can uh, actually uh, help you in your political career right and um, you know show them that uh, we're not here to sort of um, get everyone in trouble and expose everyone for corruption but we're here to sort of um, uh, you know, if we have this law, then uh, there is an actual proper accounting system for all your political parties, and uh, you know, and and you you can get your accounts organized, you get your parties more organized, you can fundraise more strategically, and uh, you know, you because right now what's happening is um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the government uh, politicians are getting. Um, uh, are getting uh, caught by the uh, anti the Malaysian Anti Corruption Commission uh, for uh, you know fraud, money laundering, tax ev evasion, which a lot of it has to do with political financing because these people are found with uh, money in their personal bank accounts because there's just no other way for them to, to store political funds because the system is unregulated. So um, so yeah, so that's just one thing that you know that I think is important to keep in mind that uh, uh, you know. Politicians are humans. They respond to incentives. So, how do you make that work um, work for us, work for think tanks, and the causes that we want to uh, that we want to fight for? And uh, one, I just wanted to add one more thing, which is um, uh, ideas always get these uh, these this comments from uh, from some of the more unfriendly politicians that you know um oh you you're a, you're an you're civil society you know you don't know what goes on in politics um you don't know what are the constraints we we have to work under uh, you know you can't just ask us to implement this and that so and and because i was you know because we were kind of 
tired of hearing that all the time, uh, which is why we wanted to then uh, work more closely with politicians because, you know, we wanted to to prove that, look, um, you know, we're not just here um, forcing reforms down everyone's throats, but we want to actually try and understand what are the constraints and what are the challenges that you as a politician operate under so that we can then sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, try and come up with a strategy that can work for both of us uh, where we can get our reforms uh, on the table, but you can also then come and support it because, uh, you know, you can see that we're not trying to attack you, but trying to help you and trying to just make the system better for everyone. So, um, yeah, so that's just uh, that's just my take on it and uh, and which I think many other panelists today have, have also alluded to, which is great. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ada. And uh, and we finish a minute uh, a minute past, but I think we finish with a nice nice way of, of describing this kind of partnership or collaboration, right? Co collaboration for for the public good, uh, collaboration which is a win win for both think tanks and political parties and politicians. And that's sort of the argument that all of you have stressed. You know, you have to make. You constantly have to make. Uh, but I guess that argument needs to be needs to be backed by. Different, different practices, uh, a more nuanced understanding of those of, of those political parties and politicians and what they need and how they work, of the context they work in, um, and uh, and of what can be done if uh, if there is collaboration. So uh, I want to thank um, Ida, Leandro, Sonia, Tim, and Hans, and I think and, and everybody else. Um, uh, please keep your questions or comments um, uh, coming. Uh, as always, you know we can go on forever, but uh, let's continue the conversation. You can uh, you can reach out to each other, or just um, use OTT conference and social media, and we will uh, we will happily engage and discuss this issue. Thank you very much. And uh, ten minutes, we have another session on think tanks and the media. Uh, so I hope you'll be you'll be back. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.